So welcome everyone. This is Tom Campbell, founder and CEO of Future Grasp. Uh, we welcome you to our webinar, Digital Transformation of Diplomacy in Times of Uncertainty. This is an exclusive invitation only webinar, um, which is co-hosted also by Business Analytics Institute, our good friend and colleague, Lee Schrenkel, Professor Lee Schrenkel out of Grenoble, France. So we would like to give a couple quick overviews in the beginning to start with. Um, I'm going to give a quick overview of what Future Grasp is. Uh, so Future Grasp is a company I formed roughly three years ago uh, after my stint as the first National Intelligence Officer for Technology at the National Intelligence Council, also Director of National Intelligence. I'm honored to be working with four outstanding individuals, um, serial entrepreneurs, uh, former U.S. government officials. You can read the nice verbiage up top, but basically we offer bespoke services to corporate and government clients including written thought products, briefs, global network access, and organization and facilitation of roundtables and workshops. The principal members are shown here. The website is shown below. I now hand it over to Lee uh, to give a quick introduction about Business Analytics Institute, and then we can launch into some housekeeping and start the first panel. Thank you, Tom. Lee Schlenker, the principal of the Business Analytics Institute. My work over the years has focused on the mechanics of improving organizational decision-making in a number of major corporations and public authorities. In our Institute's training and consulting activities, we explore how co-developing human and machine intelligence can improve perception, prediction, evaluation, and insight. If you'd like to more, know more, please check out baieurope.com. It's our goal in hosting this webinar to engage leaders in government, in government organizations and business to better appreciate the implications. AI offers training, consulting, and tech support services to enhance foresight, trusted communication, and decision making. I'm delighted to help moderate this discussion and to learn from your insights and experience. Thank you, Lee, outstanding. So really appreciate all the brilliant work he's done in helping to prepare for this webinar and getting all these speakers together and handling all the logistics. Along that vein, we here show the agenda slide. Hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, we will be going through some quick housekeeping, uh, as I mentioned, and then launch into uh, the first panel. So just in general, um, note that the webinar will be recorded and distributed later to speakers in social media and on the Future Grasp and Business Analytic Institute websites. Beyond the names and affiliations of the moderators and speakers, however, no personal information will be divulged. A couple housekeeping notes, if you don't mind, uh, please do obviously follow proper Zoom etiquette. There is a chat button at the bottom uh, of your display. If you could keep the chat uh, limited to insights on panel discussions only and note that comments will be shared with everyone unless you engage the private chat feature to a specific individual or panelist. We welcome also questions during the panels. There is a Q&A button also on the bottom of your display. Please post the questions to the panelists during the sessions. If we have time during, toward the end of each panel, we will ask a select few uh, questions uh, from the audience. The webinar flow for each panel in general will be as such. There'll be approximately 10 minutes per panelist for opening comments, followed by moderator questions and then attendee questions if time allows. So I will now roll over to the first panel, uh, invite uh, Lee Schlenker, Andrew Hyde and Jeff Odlum to go through review. There's a quick um, slide with the um, panel participants and I will stop sharing my screen now and give control over to Lee, Andrew, and Jeff for their uh, participation. Thank you. And I will go dark myself just so the purposes of the recording and uh, future. Thank you, Tom. Let's jump right into the first panel on diplomatic implications. If we feel that digital transformation of diplomacy is an important subject today, we are convinced the development of effective diplomacy in times of uncertainty will be fundamental in plotting a different path out of the crisis 
know, that feature coming in. As you, we have two brilliant and seasoned diplomats with us today. Let me introduce you to Jeff Odlum, a senior advisor with the Future Grass Foundry. He is also the president of Odlum Global Strategies, which advises government and corporate clients on national security and technology policy issues, as well as emerging tech companies working with the US State Department. Jeff himself was a State Department Foreign Service Officer for 28 years, serving as a diplomat throughout Europe and the Middle East, and as a national security policy, policy maker in Washington. Andrew, on his side, and Hyde is a senior advisor with the Future Grass Foundry. His work is focused on the role of technology in foreign policy, notably information and communications technology and the application of data analytics and artificial intelligence. Andrew apparently also has 28 years of diplomatic experience with multinational organizations, including NATO, the Stability Pact for Southeast Europe, and the European Commission. Let me give the floor to Jeff. Good morning, Jeff. In examining the challenges of diplomacy today, I have the impression that the crisis has accelerated and amplified a number of underlying societal, political, and economic trends. From your point of view, to what extent is diplomacy threatened by executive powers that have turned a deaf ear to multilateral governance that seem inherently captive to each passing treat and limited by the very real challenges of risk, uncertainty, and ambiguity in the foreseeable future? Jeff. Thank you very much, uh, Lee and Tom. Um, I was going to show some slides if one of you can oh, give, oh, share screen, okay. I'm going to bring up some slides to help uh, supplement my presentation. There we go. So anyway, thank you, um, Tom and Lee. Thank you both for hosting this very timely um, and important webinar. Um, the topic you chose is, is, is really significant, I think, the impacts on diplomacy of, of AI, um, digital communications, and the related suite of technologies, especially in the age of, of COVID-19. Um, I would say, Tom and Lee, that you're both quite right, uh, that the impacts of these technologies on diplomacy are, are profound. Um, and they have indeed been accelerated by COVID-19 in, <clears throat> in both positive and negative ways. <clears throat> Pardon me. So I, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to share some thoughts and experiences as a former diplomat now working on technology policy. Um, and to address that very good question that, that Lee's posed. So jumping right into Lee's question, uh, absolutely yes. Uncertainty, ambiguity, risk, most definitely are, and, and frankly always have been um, impediments to effective diplomacy. I'd say that throughout human history, we've been constantly confronted by uncertainty and ambiguity as we, as we try to make sense of our current reality and as we try to plan for the future. So that's not new. Um, but it's the gravity of the uncertainty that the pandemic is bringing. And I'd say compounded by the speed uh, of the development of these new technologies that, that are developing far faster than our ability to control them. And the serious dangers that are posed by irresponsible use of these technologies. All of these factors, I think, are combining to leave us facing, I feel like it's as unsettled a world um, in terms of diplomacy and geopolitics, uh, frankly, as I've ever seen. Um, I mean, effective diplomacy is built on the ability uh, to, one, understand accurately what's happening in the world, and then communicate clearly to others uh, what our nation's core values and interests are, and then to be able to identify and work towards common goals with friends and adversaries alike. And diplomats and foreign ministries who can do these three things well are usually very successful at preventing or mitigating conflict, um, at forging alliances, and at building pragmatic international institutions that can help us manage these complex global challenges like a pandemic um, or climate change or nuclear nonproliferation. So, so having said that, I agree that we are now facing a particularly um, uncertain moment in history. The world that is being ushered in as a consequence of the, no, the novel coronavirus pandemic, it is new and it can be very scary. Um, I think we're seeing some, some trends, some negative trends. <clears throat> Nation states are becoming 
more parochial. Um, their domestic politics are certainly becoming more nationalist and isolationist, both in the U.S. and, and throughout the world. Uh, I think we're seeing the United States and China are heading toward a prolonged confrontation as strategic adversaries. Um, there's a risk of deco decoupled economies, decoupled technology ecosystems, and that's fueling a destabilizing race to achieve AI dominance, mostly between the U.S. and China. So I, I do feel like we're facing a uh, a fraught moment uh, or a hinge moment in history that to me has echoes of uh, 1918 or 1945 or 1989 in the sense that we are seeing uh, a new geopolitical paradigm taking shape at the same time that we're seeing a suite of disruptive technologies emerging faster than our laws or our ethics can keep up with. Um, the good news is that like in 1918, um, and 1945 and 1989, crisis can bring opportunity if we manage it well. Um, I think we're actually much more empowered than we realize to shape these trends and, and point them towards a more stable future. Um, I think in order not only to, to mitigate, but hopefully even master the uncertainty and the ambiguity ahead, diplomats everywhere, and especially at the, the US State Department in particular, they need to really lean into this moment um, and learn to harness the power of these technologies in the service of American diplomacy and in the service of allies diplomacy. Um, I feel like if properly understood and properly applied, <clears throat> these transformative technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, big data analytics, these can actually help, <clears throat> help bring more stability and more predictability to geopolitics. They can lessen the risk of armed conflict and they can promote human rights and econ economic development globally if, if properly and responsibly used. So here's the challenge of the moment for, at least for American diplomacy. These transformative technologies are still in early stages of development. Um, they're in very, very early stages of adoption by the State Department and by friendly foreign ministries. Most diplomats have only, fr frankly, honestly, most diplomats have only a basic understanding of these technologies and how to use them. So number one, I think it should be a top priority for the next US administration uh, to commit to training every US diplomat in the basics of artificial intelligence, machine learning, data analytics, quantum information science, and 5G telecommunications, telecommunications technologies, and then equip them uh, to use those technologies in the field. I'd say fortunately the State Department, um, and I will defer to Andrew, my colleague who's still working there, the State Department seems to be overcoming its um, traditional aversion to technology and has taken several promising steps recently. Um, for example, it's established a center for data analytics earlier this year. Um, it's proposed to Congress to create a new bureau responsible for cybersecurity and emerging technology policies and programs. Um, and it's developed an internal framework for international engagement on AI. Uh, and these are all great steps. They hold great promise. Um, I would also like to see the State Department expand its technology ecosystem by creating an in-house lab, an AI for diplomacy lab, which would be similar to the in-house technology labs that, that almost every other executive branch department or agency has, including Defense Department, um, CIA, FBI, even USAID all have their own in-house tech labs. I'd love to see state have an in-house tech lab. I'd also love to see the State Department simplify and, and speed up the technology acquisition process to help American companies get the latest American technology into the hands of American diplomats much, fast, much faster. Um, so, but the trend line is quite positive at state, I'm happy to say. Um, looking at the other main thrust of your question, Lee, whether the rise in you know, executive decision-making, and I would, I would say the rise in authoritarian nationalism, is this spelling the death of multilateral governance, especially of technologies? Well, first, I think we need to accept that the United States is no longer a dominant enough superpower to solve any global problem unilaterally, unilaterally, even if it wanted to. I think that's been the case for the past 10 or 15 years, um, but it's, it's getting even more so now. When you have complex transnational challenges, like I mentioned earlier, climate change, pandemics, nuclear nonproliferation, um, I would add setting global standards on responsible AI to that list, challenges like that can only be solved multilaterally. The good news is that the US used to be really good at building alliances and coalitions to tackle common threats. And I believe the, the US has, the State Department has not yet lost that diplomatic muscle memory on how to do so. So to regain the, the diplomatic initiative on AI, uh, I think the State Department should develop 
um, a diplomatic blueprint effectively for collaborating on AI developments with allies and partners around the world. And the point would be not only to advance common diplomatic interests, but also to ensure that future technologies are used responsibly and governed by rules and standards that reflect uh, American and Western values. Now on this front, I'm actually quite encouraged by the recent recommendations from the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, the NSCAI, um, on how the executive branch, including the State Department, should reorient itself, themselves, for great power competition in the digital age. The NSCAI, and I recommend uh, the audience uh, check out their website, nscai.gov, they've issued their most recent report earlier this week, uh, and they call for a dramatic expansion of bilateral and multilateral diplomatic cooperation on AI, including ideas like um, pursuing technology cooperation agreements with Asian partners like India, South Korea, and Japan. They call for um, agreement on data sharing with allies in NATO and with partners in the European Union. Um, they recommend that the US government take the lead in establishing a digital coalition of democratic states to push back against digital authoritarianism. Um, and they, they especially encourage working with the private sector, the American private sector, to reshape international standards at global standards setting organizations uh, in the UN system. So these are all, in my opinion, these are all very smart bipartisan ideas. Um, and I certainly hope the next administration will give high priority to implementing them. Uh, uh, a final point I wanna make um, is the importance of making sure that the US government and US technology sector are working in sync. And I know we have a lot of uh, members from the audience today from, from the tech sector, as well as from the government. So this is a great convening opportunity to make this point. Most new technologies and tools are being developed by the private sector, not by governments. So AI enabled tools that have a direct or could have a direct impact on diplomacy, like social media platforms, um, data analytics, uh, natural language processing and language translation, facial recognition, um, using drones and robots for humanitarian assistance delivery, um, and even gaming and virtual reality um, that can, they can impact and amplify diplomacy. These are all coming from Silicon Valley's big five companies for the most part, and to some degree from China's big three companies. They're not really coming from government labs. So because US firms and academia still lead the world in developing AI, um, this is good, but the, the U.S. government lacks China's ability to be able to simply order its country's technology sector to apply that technology specifically to advance national security. And this obviously puts the United States at a big disadvantage. Uh, and put, in fact, putting the U.S. at an even greater disadvantage is that a lot of these American technology companies seem to be opposed on principle to working with the Defense Department uh, the intelligence community and law enforcement agencies, even in the name of, of strengthening national security. On the other hand, and this is, this is, I think, worth pursuing, I think the State Department can build a strong relationship with Silicon Valley based on the argument that there are a number of shared values between Foggy Bottom and Silicon Valley, like promoting peace and stability, promoting human rights, promoting sustainable economic development, mitigating conflict. So I'm a strong believer and advocate for the idea that the State Department can and should build on these shared values to strengthen the relationship with Silicon Valley. Um, for example, by inviting technology companies to beta test, you know, AI for diplomacy tools um, at US embassies in the field. Um, the State Department should assign US diplomats on, you know, lengthy sabbaticals at US technology companies and bring in technology um, experts to, to work uh, on temporary duty at the State Department. Um, and certainly the U.S. government should give the U.S. private sector, tech sector, and academia more of a role in helping American diplomacy promote American technology and American global leadership on AI. Now, interestingly, at the same time, tech companies are not waiting for an invitation from the U.S. government to play a bigger role in technology governance. Uh, I think we're seeing the bigger technology companies, I mean, they've gained so much power in recent years that they are now acting in some ways like nation states including shaping global data and internet standards around their technologies. A lot of them are building IT infrastructure globally, um, and they are literally using diplomacy to influence the UN and, and foreign governments. If you look at Microsoft, for example, they've even appointed their own ambassadors with that title to the United Nations and to the European Union. Uh, and most big tech companies are hiring their own diplomatic teams. Um, so the door is wide open, frankly, for much closer public-private partnerships 
between U.S. government and the private sector with regard to um, global governance of AI. Um, but the window's closing, so we have to move as fast as we can on that. So just to wrap up, I, I, I would say that this is far from the first time that the conduct of diplomacy has been upended by new technology. Um, I have a bullet at the bottom of my screen that on being handed the first telegraphic message ever sent from a British embassy abroad to Her Majesty's Foreign Office in 1855, the British Foreign Secretary Lord Palmerston was reported to have yelled at, by God, this is the end of diplomacy. You know, the telegraph representing the end of diplomacy. It's, it's kind of amusing now, but that's, you know, that's the concern that some traditional diplomats feel about new technologies. The bottom line to me is that as long as societies choose to organize themselves into nation states, then those nation states have no choice but to interact with each other. And whether that interaction happens face to face or by written or emailed correspondence or by telephone, by text, by video conference, um, someday by virtual reality avatar, by brain computer interface linked with a 10G internet of things, or maybe even by a communication technology that we have not even yet imagined. Regardless of the, the means of conveyance, diplomacy will carry on. But whichever nation states have the foresight to adapt and master the new technologies of diplomacy, they're the ones who will enjoy a commanding comparative advantage over competitors um, in their ability not only to convene allies, negotiate treaties, persuade and deter adversaries, but also to gather and analyze data, to understand events, to predict future trends and predict specific outcomes and make optimized decisions at digital speed. So in the, I'd say in this new era of, of great power competition with authoritarian adversaries, I think the winner will be determined by whichever side's diplomats are able to use these technologies most effectively over the next 20 years uh, to promote their society's values and interests within the international community. Whoever wins that competition in the next 20 years is gonna shape the direction of human history for the rest of the 21st century. <clears throat> so on that profound note, <laughs> I'm happy to stop there um, and turn the floor back to you, Lee, and uh, bring in my friend and colleague, uh, Andrew Hyde. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Some excellent points. As you're unsharing your screen, please. Sure. Uh, one of the points that I particularly appreciated was that AI cannot be a goal in itself and that the end goal has to be humanity. The only winner, potential winners possible would be humanity itself. Which right, right. brings me to the idea that technology is not always neither neutral nor necessarily uh, positive in its impact on traditional diplomacy. And that's what I would like to explore with uh, Andrew today. Andrew, in your recent experience, has the tendency of digital communications to favor gamesmanship over statesmanship and opinions over facts limited the effectiveness of diplomatic practice? And has the lockdown and its aftermath compromised the capacity of state actors to clarify their positions and to address complex problems? Andrew Hyde. Andrew, we need to turn, you need to turn your micro on, please. Your mic on. The curse of, the curse of uh, unmuting, sorry. Um, thank you very much, Lee, and, and thanks, Jeff, uh, for that, that excellent uh, opening set of comments. I think you provided us some really thought-provoking ideas on some tools and some methods going forward. Um, what I want to do, as, as Lee's prompts and questions indicate, is maybe take a slight step back and think about um, the, the current impact on diplomacy after the pandemic. Um, and will it last or will we revert back to, to past practice? I think, again, Jeff has pointed out some opportunities in the technology area that, that, that might lead us into a new kind of uncharted territory with a lot of possibilities. Um, but I wanna look at what fundamental structural changes to diplomatic practice have been caused or accelerated by the pandemic. Uh, as Jeff said, effective diplomacy really has suffered a, a setback as a solution to global problems, at least as we, as we have known diplomacy in the past. It has exposed and exacerbated existing structural weaknesses. Um, and this has resulted really in ineffective international efforts as we've all observed in the last few months to confront the virus 
and its fallout, its economic fallout and societal fallout. Um, and it's been further compounded by <clears throat> nationalism and accelerated uh, great power competition, US, China, Russia, and others, and how that's, that's impacted. A couple of specific impacts uh, I, wanna, I wanna just touch on in response to Lee's comments is really to look at the, the role of digital intermediation um, in relation to the pandemic. Uh, what, what has digital inter intermediation done to um, uh, diplomatic practice um, in terms of visibility, in terms of speed, uh, in terms of the potential for manipulation? And Lee, your question talked a little bit about that. Um, I, I, I guess I've seen both observed um, professionally and, and observed um, from others that digital intermediation is, is both a new barrier, but also a new facilitator. Um, <clears throat> so we've all had the awkward introductions or interactions. I forgot to unmute for a second. Okay, a little awkward. Um, but we're here and we are joining from a lot of different countries in the world together on this platform. And so, you know, we haven't had to travel anywhere. It's been relatively easy, friction-free to do this. And that's created a lot of new opportunities. Um, admittedly, as we all know, when we did travel, um, one of the benefits of traveling was the sort of informal side conversations you could have around meetings like this over coffee in the in the in the lounges. Um, obviously, those are much harder to do now. Um, so the connections that we have with each other are more visible and common connections. And that's good. We 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 experience the same thing, um, but less of that nuanced uh, uh, interaction, perhaps that is such the the lubricant, if you will, for common diplomacy. Um, I think the other thing that, <clears throat> another aspect of this though that, that is important to consider is that there's been a quicker turnaround on dialogues, faster reactions from governments, from uh, countries, from delegations, um, because they can sort of take on the information all at once quickly in a, in a larger setting, um, but then perhaps less con consultation with others, with other allies, with other diplomats to really understand the nuances of the various positions around the table and how we would we as diplomats might might confront that and consider it. <clears throat> I think the other thing that is has been obvious in this uh, uh, process and in this uh, this period we've been through is the vulnerability to manipulation from bad actors or or people acting in bad faith. Those aren't necessarily the same thing, um, but they're pretty similar. We're able, as as again practitioners, but even observers, we're less able to discern actual positions in some cases because we're confined to some extent looking through these screens at the way people want to present themselves and, and again you list the you miss the informal interaction you you miss the, the the sort of sideways observation of other countries and other positions to understand where they're coming from and how their their position might be adapting or evolving it is fair to say that that virtual reality and virtual uh environments <clears throat> do enable more efficient explanation and sharing of of national positions um, on, on key issues around the world um, from authoritative sources. So rather than delegates having to go to one location and share their positions, you often have higher level people in their headquarters, in their governments who can speak with authority about their position. Um, but it does, I think, I think so that's the, the position sharing. On the other side, the ability to negotiate a common position after you've staked out your national positions, say in a multilateral setting, the UN or in the EU, your, your capacity to negotiate those positions, I think is very much hindered by this environment that we're operating in. Again, that nuance, that ability to have side conversations, that ability to discern the, the emotional feel in the room is a lot harder in these virtual environments that we're operating in. And that is so key to negotiation, to understanding what's possible, what your rivals, what your allies are looking to do, and how you can kind of fashion a common, a common position. All of that is based very much on tr trust and careful understanding. And again, in these virtual environments, I think that's, that's harder for, for at least traditional types of diplomacy that we've been accustomed to. Um, at the same time, I think we've seen that there's a heightened role for local actors. In, in a particular setting. So missions that work at, at, in New York at the UN, for example, or missions in Brussels for the EU that are, that are still having the personal interactions. If you're trying as a diplomat to, to fashion that common 
uh, approach, you're going to rely on your local people or the people who are at site to give you some of that, that nuance and understanding, perhaps more than you have in the past. So it's a little bit of a dichotomy. I mean, you can more national capital people can speak and, and authoritatively stake out a position. But when you want to arrive at a final negotiated agreement, you really do need to rely on the local people to give you that kind of perspective and in, insight. So uh, Lee, you mentioned the effect of lockdown on um, the capacity of state actors to support positions and negotiate compromises. I think that's also a very important uh, element. I mean, I've talked a bit about negotiation, um, <clears throat> but I want to—I oh, just want to say that the, 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 the recent trend towards more transactional diplomacy that we've seen certainly from Washington DC and elsewhere it, and less strategic diplomacy <clears throat> has, has I think been compounded by this requirement to be more virtual. And so I think it's very important, and, and Jeff I think alluded to this in some of his comments about the way to use technologies is getting back to a more strategic diplomatic approach that would give us greater context and perhaps allow us to take that step back and realize what, is, what are some of the issues that are truly at stake. I think more efficient use of time in a virtual setting can enable this, um, this, this ability to look at a strategic approach. So we, transaction is often driven by time constraints. Perhaps we don't have as many time constraints now because people aren't spending so much time traveling and all the friction that comes with often international meetings. So now we have an opportunity, in my view, to, to perhaps take that time and use it for a better understanding and a more strategic understanding of, of, of diplomacy and diplomatic practice. Finally, I just want to say that there's, there, there has been a greater autonomy, I think we've seen it for some multinational players because of this environment, that you have national positions, you, you're relying on your local actors maybe to help you shape a common position, but ultimately you need perhaps an authority who is on the ground, be it the UN Secretary General, be it the High Representative for Foreign Policy at the EU and others, who are maybe more empowered, more enabled to take, to, to to, to identify and articulate the common position and take that back to national actors to give them a sense of, okay, here's what's at stake, here's, here's what seems to be a reasonable compromise. And because those of us sitting back in the capitals are limited in a way of, of having that context, we're more reliant on those independent third party actors to help us find a, a solution or a compromise. And so I think that's an important, that's an important way forward. Finally, I just want to talk because I know our audience, you know, is, is, is interested in what are the implications for outsiders and bystanders in this process? So if you're looking into the diplomatic world, what, what do you need to take away from it? One is, I think, the increased use of open forums and other forms of, forms of communication like social media have been a boon to that. You get more insight than I think I've seen in my career. In, I mean, in the last few years, I've seen more insight that outsiders can get than previous in my career in terms of what the different positions are what's at stake, where we're, where we're headed. Secondly, I think you can get a clear understanding, therefore, of national positions and the differences. Again, this is if you're an outsider looking in and you have a chance to attend events, virtual events, you can see what the national positions are. You can better understand where the openings, the gaps, the, 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 the opportunities might exist if you're looking to influence the process going forward. If you're that ambassador that Nick talked, that uh, Jeff talked about earlier, you know, it, Microsoft's ambassador at the UN elsewhere, you can look at that and understand a little better. Um, and, and then it's also, though I think harder for outsiders, I will say the other side of this is harder to discern where the actual centers of power are because you're sort of being confronted with equalized national positions and you're not getting a sense of where the, where the movement in the room is. And so you need to know what you don't know there. I think there's a way to deal with it, but needing, knowing what you don't know is, 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 is critical. Um, and then again, the point I finally made on empowering local players, it's important, again, these representatives are at the site. It's important to build the relationships with the local players, with the missions to the UN, with the missions to the EU and elsewhere, to help get a better understanding as to, well, what are they seeing on the ground and how can you jump in at the right point to share your position and your viewpoint? I'll stop there because I know we're running low on time, but thank you very much. Now, Lee, you're still being muted. I just wanted to show that I too could mute myself. <laughs> uh, Andrew, some excellent points, thank you. We only have time for one question, which I would like to ask to both Jeff and to Andrew. 
from quite a normative position, I suggested the primacy of human intelligence over AI. AI today is essentially machine learning, which favors a very logical intelligence. But to me, a effective diplomat must master other forms of human intelligence, interpersonal intelligence, uh, spiritual intelligence, uh, emotional intelligence. I wanted to ask both of you whether these forms of intelligence today can be captured, mimicked, amplified by the forms of machine learning that we're experimenting with, or whether this is indeed a challenge for the tech companies in trying to bring what they have to offer to the table of diplomacy. Um, that's a very challenging question, Lee. Um, I, uh, for, the, for the technical capabilities, I would defer to future panelists who have much more engineering background than I do. But my, my quick response is absolutely right. Um, to be effective, diplomacy isn't just about analytic knowledge. It's about emotional intelligence and empathy and understanding the other side and persuasion um, and having that, having that emotional human connection. Um, eventually, someday, uh, I do believe that you know, machine learning algorithms, if... if um, trained on correct, on, on the best possible data, might be able to replicate all of, all of those different types of intelligence. We're, we're nowhere near that yet. And that to me is why the, one of the most important things we need to do now is get the principles, the AI principles correct, um, and get the standards correct, and, and set up guardrails to protect the integrity uh, of the data that's being used to train the algorithms. Now there is um, a growing consensus around some AI principles that was approved late last year by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD in Paris. Uh, I think all 45 OECD members, including the US government, signed on to the OECD's AI principles, um, which are frankly, they're, they're relatively broad, but they do offer a good roadmap both to governments and to companies on, on how to design AI responsibly, safely, with transparency, accountability, all these other kinds of things. So I, I think it's important to keep our eyes on that and make sure that the AI that we do develop um, is shaped based on human values. Thank you, Jeff. I'll just, I'll just jump in quickly on this. I think it's a great question, and, and I, I totally support everything Jeff said. I, I really do believe that if you if you have a firm basis, an analytic basis, it's it's an important step forward, and that therefore the integrity of the of the data and the integrity of the AI that's working on it and the transparency of algorithms, I think would be important to understand. But that's not really the point of your question. It is, as you said, these other elements of diplomacy. And I touched a little bit on that in my, in my presentation. And I think it's, it's vitally important. Yes, there is a scope for AI, I think, in doing some of that. There are, you can have sentiment analysis of, of remarks and comments that are made. You can get a sense of where people are going. Um, but I guess I would argue the main benefit of AI would really be enabling the humans to do what they need to do, which is really a lot of that building, a lot of that empathy and allowing them the freedom to, to really focus on, if you will, the emotional side after they have the firm and trusted analytic basis to work with. And that, that requires the human interaction. Um, and, and so it, AI will be very important for that, but it will not replace the diplomatic practice and craft in that, in that, in that category. Thank you. On behalf of Future Grasp and BAI, we would really sincerely like to thank Jeff and Andrew for their contributions here. And I think it's an excellent transition to talk about diplomatic continuity. Uh, Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, so we'll go over to panel two. So panel two, I'd like to begin, uh, which will focus upon the need for diplomacy continuation. As we learned in panel number one, the new pandemic driven world order is one with challenged traditional views of globalization, as well as intensified isolationism and cultural tensions. Diplomacy is needed now more than ever, in fact. Dipl diplomats must find new ways to work in this pandemic era, as well as what the current turmoil in operations may mean post COVID-19. So we're thrilled to welcome two excellent speakers today. Uh, first is Ariel Aram, who is program chair and associate professor at Virginia Tech. 
And second is Eugenio Garcia, who is Minister, Counselor, and Chargé d'Affaires ad interim in the Brazilian Embassy in Conakry Republic. That is a $23 billion BCL. So I will turn the floor over to them to share screens if they like, or just feel free and speak. Welcome, gentlemen, and look forward to your insights. Ariel, would you like Thanks to for having us. Medical order? <laughs> sure. I'm an academic, so of course I have a screen to share. I respect in, that. <laughs> yeah, in the, the last uh, uh, six months, um, really prompted by the crisis uh, of, of the, 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 the shutdown and the, the creation of the sort of new Zoom world, um, I've been really interested in the kinds of practices that people have adopted to use this technology. And I, there's a, uh, a phrase that's used in academia called the Zoomification, which has just sort of arrived. I'm sure people have heard of it. And of course, it's, it's not just Zoom, it's Zoom and uh, the, the Microsoft competitor to Zoom and WebEx and all the other um, tele, uh, telecommunication and um, teleconferencing sites, which are really being used in ways that they had never really been anticipated to be used before um, and taxed in ways that uh, have never been taxed before. And we can see this in some cases um, by the, by the, the fact that they're all there, especially in April and May, we're having server problems because there was just so much traffic uh, uh, over them that much more than they had ever anticipated being used. So in response to some of the questions that Tom posed to me uh, back in the, in the spring when we were really just beginning the, 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 the lockdown period, I started to wonder what does Zoom and its analogs do to, to learning, interaction, and collaboration? Uh, initially, I was interested in learning and collaboration between organizations. So essentially, how does the US government communicate with its, with its counterparts? Uh, at forum like the, like the United Nations, like the OSCE, uh, like NATO. But what I rapidly learned was that the question wasn't just how organizations communicate with other organizations, but how do organizations communicate internally? Uh, how do organizations, group A and group B within those organizations know what's happening? And early on in the pandemic between April and August, I conducted about 30 informal interviews with uh, local and state government officials, federal agencies, including State Department, um, NGOs, international uh, go uh, governing organizations like the World Bank, uh, as well as development contractors. So a lot of groups uh, that were involved in, in, in public policy writ large, and most of them were f focused on international engagements of, in different forms. Uh, some of them were kind of were very traditional uh, diplomacy, and some of them were uh, in, in kind of adjacent to diplomacy. A number of key findings showed up uh, looking across these interview uh, reports. The first is that Zoom and its analogs slow the feedback loop in communication. It's very hard to detect um, how, other, how the person on the other side of the Zoom box is responding to you when you raise a point in a, tele, in a, in a, in a, tele, in a, in a teleconference format. And it's surprising that um, People, how that people use intuitive knowledge to understand the, the, this this feedback loop, and that feedback loop is essentially broken in a in a two dimensional representation of the person. Uh, U.S. State Department officials particularly emphasize this that they were in fact trained to do things like reading body language and adjusting to uh, noticing uh, changes in tone and pitch, and that that became dramatically harder uh, in the, in the, in, in the zoom format. And as a result, it was much harder to have a kind of a back and forth to learn what the other person had to say, and then incorporate it into the pro in, into the, into their own responses. So that feedback loop has slowed down. The second main point is that technological access is often more important than substantive input because of the way uh, uh, Zoom negotiations, we could, uh, we could call that in, in a big sense, both within organizations and between organizations are conducted. The person who is most adept at what, what's, what one of my interlocutors called the track changes diplomacy is the person who ultimately has kind of the authority over the document. It's not necessarily the person who has um, uh, the most substantive or, or, or important knowledge on the topic. It's, it's the person who knows how to maneuver the uh, kind of the common space between in, within the negotiation. Of course, this isn't a new challenge. This has existed well before uh, before the, the the adoption of, of Zoom and COVID, um, but it, it's been exacerbated because so much interaction is done essentially uh, over over in, in shared drives of various kinds. Third, 
The turn to Zoom narrows the stakeholders who were involved in a negotiation. Because there's always going, because of the need to um, limit access in, in order for, mainly for security reasons, but also just for practical reasons, uh, the number of people who can be involved in a conversation is very limited. Uh, we all know what it feels like to be on a Zoom call where there's 3,000 people att attending, right? It's almost impossible to have any, uh, any communications in that format. And as a result, for the sake of, uh, the sake of efficiency, uh, there is a tendency to create a really narrow group that is involved in negotiating sp very specific points in, in, in the communication. That's good for efficiency, but it can often leave, people, leave key stakeholders out who have to be brought back in later in the process. And so they gain efficiency at the front end and lose it at the back end. Third and kind of related is that the Zoom format fosters a compartmentalization of issues. So that negotiations that are being conducted or discussions that are being conducted about issue A and issue B, which are substantively linked, but have different personnel staff to them, very hard to keep track of what's going on in A and B at the same time. And so opportunities to kind of, to make trades uh, that go across dimensions become much, become much more challenging. There are of course a kind of standard business school approaches to how, to how to deal with these things, right? There are ways to reorganize your meetings and you can, you can read these, uh, they're all over the internet now, how to do a, do a more effective Zoom meeting, how to handle track changes. There's, there's no secret in them, um, but I think that the implementation is especially hard in formats where there is the sense of, of a singular government voice, where there is a need to be really on, where there's a need to be on message and where the messaging is, is, um, is really has to be authoritative, I'll put it in that, in that format. And so just because we know how to do it in an, in, a, in an abstract sense, doesn't mean that most organizations have actually been able to implement it. I wanna leave plenty of time for questions and answers and I can see some of my, my chat boxes sort of is, is, is blowing up. I'll take a look at those in a minute. But I wanna leave on a, on, on a kind of a, a, a bigger note, which is that especially early in the process, so most of my interviews were concluded in August, um, there was an enormous amount of effort and energy and emphasis on compensating for what we're seeing as the limits of these technologies, that it was so hard to work in a teleconference environment that a lot of people were spent a lot of time essentially trying to, stay, to tread water. Let's just get back to the place where we were before, before this happened. And there was accordingly very little attention to leveraging technological advantages. And this was something that, um, that Andrew Hyde brought up just a few minutes ago, that there are really strong technological advantages to using Zoom. Uh, for instance, jet lag disappears as a, as a concern. Um, you can be in multiple, you can be much more efficient in the way that you conduct yourselves in certain, in certain regards. Um, but there was almost no attention to, uh, to gaining those advantages. There was a real sense that what we need to do is create the same, for, get as close as we possibly can to a face-to-face -face interaction. And one of the things that I'm, I'm kind of exploring in a, in a tentative way, so it's not, it's not, my, it's not my call to make, but, it, but I'm exploring as a, as a sort of intellectual proposition, is that there may be ways to leverage this technology to create forms of interaction that are actually not duplicative or analogous to the face-to-face -face meeting in the coffee shop and going around and, and, and the, the, the coffee meeting, but actually substitute for it in a different, entirely different way. Um, I'm sure some people in this room have, have thought of that in some format, and I'm, I'd love to hear some of the ideas about how to make that happen um, in a kind of more, more concrete sense. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Eugenio. Okay, thank you for having me. Thank you for this uh, kind of invitation. Um, Ariel, real quick. There you go, great, brilliant, thank you. Go ahead, Eugenio. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thank you for this uh, kind invitation. Thank you, Tom. I will speak in my individual capacity as an academic researcher rather than as a representative of any government or organization. We, we know that this uh, ongoing digital transformation has been around for some time. So there is this old tension between traditional diplomacy and the changes brought about by technological innovation with real-time information spreading around the globe almost instantly. And diplomats, I agree, need to adapt to a, a new digital environment. I, I, I speak as a practitioner. In the United Nations, for instance, where I was working until last month, it's clear that the organization needs a reform to be updated and become more 
action oriented or technology wise and focus on results. I always say that if the UN is too slow, too bureaucratic, too attached to the past, it won't be able to deliver in the 21st century. So we do need a more inclusive multilateralism and embrace uh, multi-stakeholderism, engages civil society, private companies, and so on. So I believe uh, we are now living a COVID-19 paradox. We are closer online, but further apart in the real world. Mm -hmm. We now have all these new technologies to engage more people, more webinars like this one, more opportunities to connect virtually. But when you look at international politics today, all this fragmentation, mistrust, ideological divide, polarization, geopolitical tensions, decoupling, we are not united at all so, or closer together. So there is a crisis of confidence in international institutions. And so to manage these divisions, we need more diplomacy, not less. So uh, Lord Palmerston was quoted, uh, and I, I agree that diplomacy is not, uh, uh, is not dead. <laughs> so uh, the problem is online meetings don't allow real face-to-face -face interactions. So in some sensitive negotiations, they, they were made more difficult. So informal dialogue outside these meetings is, is not the same anymore. So I. I like to say that diplomacy happens in a political space where foreign policy is made and digital capabilities are now in the front line to try to influence public opinion and control the narrative in some cases. And governments everywhere are now much more active on social media to win the crown or share, shape people's minds. But again, that's the paradox. We see digital diplomacy being used to divide people, not to make them to overcome their difference. This is why we need to discuss further. Yes, we wish to leverage digital capabilities for diplomacy, but what for? To divide and conquer or to integrate people in search for common solutions? So you can ask me, for example, about formalities. Uh, formalities in diplomatic engagements, uh, if they become less important as a result of the digital diplomacy. But first, human nature didn't change. Human needs remain the same. So digital diplomacy is yet another channel to deal with human problems at the international level. Formalities didn't disappear. I, I think during the pandemic, diplomats were left in a, in a state of COVID-induced hibernation. They were forced to go online and, or risk becoming less and less relevant. So last September, during the high-level week in the UN, as you know, world leaders delivered pre-recorded video messages only. The UN headquarters became almost a ghost building. I was there so, uh, uh, some months ago. There was no corridor diplomacy or informal face-to-face -face negotiations on sensitive matters. Uh, and being the trust takes time. So the UN can be a very formal and hierarchical place. I, I remember hours of boring statements by dozens of delegations. And can you really trust someone in a Zoom meeting if everything is recorded? and you are not supposed to improvise. So no wonder diplomats are much more cautious in, in this situation. So that's why the Security Council has closed the doors, uh, mm. consultations uh, of the whole in a private consultation room, away from the media, away from outsiders. It's when diplomats come face to face and put their difference on the table and try to find common ground, for, for example, in security accounts for a joint statement or a draft resolutions. And some diplomats complain that, that diplomacy is about confidentiality. And if secure environments cannot be guaranteed, reaching compromise becomes much more difficult. And it's easier to hide or escape from a compromise if you don't want your position to be changed. So in a, in a way, um, the virtual room 
mostly favor the status quo. So that's my view. But uh, of course, we will be further discuss these issues. Thank you. Brilliant, Eugenio, and thank you also, Ariel. So just a couple questions, just one quick note. We are at time, but I'm gonna go over because I, I love this discussion. So we'll take a, a short two minute break at the termination of a couple quick questions here. So we will go over a little bit into the 11 o'clock hour, um, mount, uh, or noon time mountain, or Eastern time rather. So um, first question to Ariel. First off, I loved your survey, Ariel. That, I wasn't aware that you were doing that great work. That's, that's brilliant. So a couple a follow up questions. So in your discussions with people, do you think that uh, things, do people get the impression that things are going to return to normal or is this sort of a new normal state that, that we're in, that we're stuck in even if the pandemic um, is sl slightly resolved or obviated, even if vaccines, are we uh, having an, a, a massive adjustment to our relationships in these kind of environments now, even if we slightly go back to the new, no to the old normal? I think it's important to distinguish two different things. I think the workplace life and the sort of the way the daily way that work is conducted probably will change for some people. Some people will will be using uh, these teleconferencing fu functions much more and a lot of travel and face-to-face and -face interactions will eliminate. Some people will get back uh, to, to kind of what we could think of as traditional diplomacy that involves, as Eugenio mentioned, the formal and then the corridor conversations to, to the pair, that, that are paired. I think this, the, second, the, the second question though is, whether there will be a, re, uh, a reconnection globally uh, mm -hmm. that you can, you can conduct all of the diplomacy that you want that doesn't necessarily rebuild international institutions or, inter or interstate relationships. Uh, and I think that's a much harder, uh, harder, harder question. I don't think that the technology will, will solve that problem. Uh, even if we are able to agree on sets of standards for communications and for the use of some of, of, of some of these AI of these AI techniques, I don't think that the, the, I think that they, they are they are tools, and it is up to the, the principals to use those tools in a way that is uh, co cooperative, uh, comprehensive, or exclusionary. So I'm maybe in that sense I'm a I'm a I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical of the kind of a techno determinism that mm -hmm. that some people adopt, but I, I think it's an open question. Yeah, very much open question, and we'll see how things develop. A question for Eugenio in that light, being on the African continent as you are, we, I'd love to hear your perspective. So I know there are a number of states there that are not so technologically advanced. How, from your impression, might they better cope with this continuing need for digital diplomacy now? Yes, uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, yeah, for, for many poor countries, they still need to make progress in very basic infrastructure. So electricity, for example. In many African countries, access to electricity is not guaranteed for everyone. So then comes the digital divide and the problem of connectivity. You need a reliable connection to stay online and attend virtual meetings. As you know, I'm now based in West Africa and, and before our webinar, I was really worried about the power cuts and losing my internet connection. <laughs> it happens every day here, almost three, four times a day. Mm -hmm. So it's not obvious how we can make digital diplomacy available to everyone globally, if in some cases this is a luxury item. But having said that, there are some practical strategies that we can think about to bridge the technological gap. First, create centers of excellence to provide the tools and capabilities to allow poor countries to have access to the technology using digital diplomacy. Second, be realistic. We know that the transformative impact of AI in diplomacy, for instance, may include data analysis, prediction, speed, cognitive enhancement, or more efficiency. But there is a long way to go until these tools are really incorporated by diplomats in their daily work, especially in developing countries. And third, uh, least developed countries will lag behind in the adoption of new technologies if there is no outside assistance. So international cooperation will be needed somehow. And one possible way ahead is to include this area in projects to be develop, developed on the ground in association with the local government and according to the different needs in each country concerned. Thank you. Excellent. So we do have one question from the uh, audience attendees. So 
It says the uh, panelists have rightly focused on negotiation, but as AI increasingly eliminates even white collar jobs, won't technology such as instant language translation headsets eliminate some functions or even some diplomatic positions? Will consular work change? And what are some of the technologies on the horizon that will have similar disruptive effects? So I, I pose that to both of you. Go ahead, Ariel. I, I will defer to the, the diplomat in the, in the call. Uh, I'll, defer to, I'll defer to Eugenio, please. Sure. Yeah, as I said, Lord Palmerston was worried about the end of diplomacy, but diplomacy is not dead. Mm -hmm. What diplomats need is to adapt. So, because this is, diplomacy is a human activity, basically. As I said, and AI cannot replace humans in human to human relations. So I think there is a role for diplomats in the future. But the problem is that old school diplomats, they simply don't want to use new technologies. I, I, they don't want to invest time and effort in learning new tools. And of course the pandemic helped accelerate the adoption of several applications, but uh, doesn't mean that they are comfortable with this new digital environment. That's the point. So. To conclude, I think COVID-19 was a wake-up call for, to change old habits. And diplomats need to adapt. Dinosaurs who don't know how to use the internet or resist to online connections, their, their, their future is green. They are heading to retirement. So what to do next? So we can think of lessons learned. Uh, uh, think of online meetings for routine work or specific tasks should continue to be the first choice. So to avoid unnecessary time consuming long distance travel and face to face meetings should be reserved for hard negotiation or key decisions to be made. So it's a matter of combining the best of both worlds, the virtual and the physical world. Going online when never possible, traveling only when you need it, mm -hmm. and then perhaps engage more and more predictions in digital diplomacy. Thank you. That, that's a great closing point, Eugenio, and I completely echo those sentiments that there is going to be, and there are changes underway right now, and I, I thank Ariel and Eugenio uh, for their brilliant comments, and we will go to a short break, so just take a two-minute break here real quick. I'll put up the agenda slide for the next panel, but thank you, gentlemen, and very much appreciate your excellent insights. Thank you. See you. Please do stay on the line, everybody. Do not log off. Just stay on line, and we'll just come back in about two minutes.
So hello, everybody. I believe we're back. If I hope everybody had a quick breather there. So um, we'd like to start our third and last panel. So within this panel, we decided we would go after a little bit more on the technology side. So um, we are looking at applied AI and security specifically. So um, from the applied AI side, we wanted to address specifically what technologies might be available in these contexts to address. Uh, and security side, we were thinking to address what is cybersecurity risks with all these Zoom webinars and everything else going on. And we have really some amazing speakers in this context today. Um, Michael Frings, Senior Regional Manager at NVIDIA uh, Networking uh, out of Mellanox. Um, Sean Canuck, founder and CEO of Exadec, and my former friend and colleague, uh, former U.S. National Intelligence Officer for Cyber Issues at the National Intelligence Council Office of Director of National Intelligence, and my good friend and colleague, Nikolai Wattstrom, who is founder and CEO of Bootstrap Labs, a leading venture capital firm in the greater Silicon Valley, San Francisco Bay Area. So gentlemen, uh, we'd like to go alphabetical just to keep it simple. So I believe that would mean Michael Frings goes first, if you don't mind, Michael. Feel free on unmute your audio there. And we'd like to have some opening comments, particularly from the NVIDIA perspective, as NVIDIA is a world leader, if not the world leader in these spaces. Michael, floor is yours. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Tom. Um, I would like to start with, uh, with a statement. And that statement is that uh, COVID-19 fuels the digitalization uh, like nothing before. And I believe that's particularly true for digital diplomacy. Um, I'm a security guy for many years, and certainly my view on that, as I'm part of NVIDIA networking, um, I look at this, uh, uh, these uh, challenges and also opportunities from a cybersecurity point of view. So uh, I believe with this statement said uh, that Cybersecurity really enables the digital diplomacy uh, very well. And that comes true for countries who have invested in the past in secure and available worldwide diplomatic networks. You know, those guys, were, those countries were not really surprised and not caught up cold with the pandemic. You know? I'm based in Germany and what we can see here particularly is, uh, and that's not only in diplomatic, uh, in the diplomatic affairs, that's true for the entire government. It's a huge enabling initiative for working remotely. So very much the same what we see in enterprise and science is going on in the, in the, in the government. And that's only possible with well-established security measures and principles uh, in place. So strong cryptography and high-performance uh, uh, gateways VPN uh, technology is really becoming a very uh, critical uh, point here. And we see that uh, so many government employees now nowadays working safely and securely uh, from home office and keeping their classification and uh, privacy rules up. And I think that's particularly important in the diplomatic uh, arena. Um, that said, also I, uh, the uh, opposite can be, uh, can, will be, is true that the pandemic exposes particularly weak infrastructures. So I guess there are the developed countries, the rich countries, the wealthy countries, the technology driven countries in the world who have this uh, kind of uh, infrastructures and technology set up. But as one of the previous speakers said, what about the poor countries? What about the countries that never thought really about it? What about the countries where diplomacy is still in the face where people doing face-to-face -face business, are not used to remote calls, to secure remote calls or to video conferences in the past. So that's really a very uh, difficult situation. That's my view on cybersecurity. And certainly as part of NVIDIA, I have to I have to have also a view from the AI perspective. And uh, well, everything is true what was said in the last panel. AI is going to enable uh, digital diplomacy, whatever that term is, because I believe that's really a very wide uh, 
uh, field is uh, so AI is really going to uh, to increase and to to make uh, a digital diplomacy much more efficient and much more uh, valuable give it give it more value um, in in IT we have this abbreviation called MTTR mean time to R whatever R is so in diplomacy it could be mean time to response so mean time to response mean time to resolution mean times to reaction uh, will become smaller and smaller yeah now nowadays we see uh, uh, policymakers and rural country uh, rulers who do uh, 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 diplomacy by themselves on instant messaging systems in uh, social media. So sometimes even overruling their diplomatic uh, uh, networks. That is certainly something that has to be taken uh, under consideration. And uh, AI will help to react on this much better than it was before because the sheer amount of data is exploding. Nobody can cope with this amount of data anymore, where no human being can do that. So we need AI, we need data and analytics uh, methodologies uh, to help us with that, to digest the data in the right way and at the end of the day to make, to come up with uh, 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 a good decision. Um, another point that I, and this is the third and last point I would like to highlight is certainly with AI, we see uh, algorithms coming up in our digital world that haven't been there before, that haven't been as efficient as they are today. Um, look at diplomacy, not only from the liaison and relationship and policy making point of view, look at it, for instance, maybe also from an immigration or visa uh, approval process in Germany, that's part of our foreign ministry's uh, uh, responsibilities. So we have now uh, uh, really sophisticated algorithms that can help us with biometric identification, with picture and video analysis, with the correlation of data. Remember the, 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 the refugee crisis we had a couple of years ago with the people from Syria coming to our country. So all these data can now be analyzed and digested in a much more precise and faster way than it was possible, uh, possible before. So overall, I really, I see really, it's like the, it's, it's like the, the, the telegraph phenomena. The, the former, the ambassador saw it as a threat, but it turned out to be a chance. That's exactly what ha will happen with AI. It looks at the moment like a threat, but it will be a chance if it will be applied correctly. Thank you. Excellent, Michael. Thank you very much. And we'll, we'll come to some questions for yourself after the panels. Sean, would you like to go next? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Tom. And I want to first say thank you to Future Grasp and the Business Analytics Institute for organizing this and inviting me to participate. And quite frankly, the two preceding panels were some of the better time I've spent listening on Zoom in the last couple of months. So thank you to those presenters. Uh, in my opening comments here, I'm gonna to try to cover four areas very briefly. The transformative impact of AI and security in the space, some of the benefits, some of the risks, and then what I'm gonna consider a outlier effect that I predict is gonna happen. So on the transformative nature, you know, as a security professional, Security requires people, processes, and technology, and you can't separate any of those from each other for the holistic effect. So we have to think about the diplomatic profession in this technology context. So for starters, you're seeing the curator of the conversation changed. It's no longer happening in the rooms at the UN, like was previously mentioned, it's happening on a platform. That means that to take Lawrence Lessig's comment that code is law, the possibilities of the interaction are going to be governed or constrained by the technology platform and its limitations or its features. A comment was made earlier about interpreters. Uh, it was the audience question, right, about the digitization of interpretation. Well, if you're the curator who gets to add nuance, the exact words you translate can have huge impact in a diplomatic setting. The valence or the tone, the very precise word choice, 
will matter. And if that is all automated, you're handing that curator role over to someone who's coded the software somewhere else who may have different values or different linguistic skills. Uh, at the pure security side, uh, the network will be compromisable unless against sophisticated actors. We saw that with Zoom earlier this year. And the devices that folks are using to connect will still be compromisable. We saw in you know, the last couple of years, whether it's through WhatsApp or other things that the Pegasus exploits and others were compromising, you know, all the iPhones and other things. So on the security level, you have to think about both of those. And I think as Mr. Garcia said, uh, the minute you're running on a platform that is recordable or on a screen that could be videotaped by another device while someone is interacting, you necessarily are in a recorded environment. It's as if you're operating in a room at a diplomatic facility that you know is bugged. And that, of course, constrains the conversations. Uh, now I want to talk about the people in the processes for a second, because these official diplomatic meetings don't happen in isolation. They're happening in the broader context of a social media broadcast environment, which is less of a conversation, but more punditry, each side stating its own positions. And true, you used to have that on the floor of the UN, and you still do. But to be able to project to vast international audiences instantaneously with a, uh, we'll call them a specific or polarized viewpoint, uh, can actually be counterproductive to diplomatic efforts of reaching compromise and understanding. And we're increasingly seeing unilateral broadcast communications that will be surrounding and coloring the nature of the official diplomatic activities. And in that respect, right now, I'm just talking about official position statements. We're not even talking about the intentional disinformation that is happening in the quasi-diplomatic international uh, public communication space. And that brings me to the professionalism that I, of di the diplomatic corps, which I believe is going to be impacted. Uh, it is undeniable that Zoom does not allow you to develop the personal relationships that you would if you were in meetings or going out to business dinners and getting to know your counterparts. Uh, and Zoom also gives you limited ability to detect the uh, body gestures, posture, and the other uh, sentiments for that would provide feedback to sensitive discussions that we as human beings pick up on. And lastly, of course, the minute the conversation is not private because it's automatically recordable means you're going to have much less informal and improvised conversation. So I think that with AI enhancing all these secure uh, technology features, you are going to see an absolute transformation of this profession. Now, what are some of the good points? First, with the technology platforms, provided there is connectivity and reliable electricity and internet connections, you're going to be able to expand the conversation. Certainly to be much more inclusive of other voices and countries who may not have had the resources to be flying diplomats everywhere to every meeting that they might want to have a voice in. And you're going to have a much easier ability to communicate to the broad global public more so than you would in closed meetings that weren't digitally recorded or digitally intermediated. Uh, there's an efficiency and cost benefit. You save time and expenses on travel. And in fact, before, if you used to have to get on a transcontinental plane, if the item was not a high enough priority, senior officials would pass on it. Where if the time investment is now logging on to Zoom from their own office, you're going to be able to get more focused attention and possibly higher level participation in more meetings than you traditionally would have because it just didn't meet threshold for those assistant secretaries or ministers. Uh, what you are going to lose by not traveling is some of the cultural understanding and appreciation. Uh, certainly those of us who've traveled a lot for work realize that we uh, appreciate some of our counterparts more and some of their views when we actually get the benefit of visiting them where they are. So now let me turn to what I consider some of the risks uh, associated with AI in the security space. First, these technologies are going to be subject to all the same concerns that AI is in other applications. The limitations of the technology itself, the potential biases in the data and the applications, and the technical vulnerabilities to manipulation. So as these algorithms that are going to be applied to the diplomatic space are created, we have to look at the training data that's going to be used to train them on, the inherent cultural biases of the coders and the programmers uh, who are creating them, 
And then, of course, to the possibility of willful manipulation of folks who understand the algorithms can take actions or provide inputs that will attempt to manipulate the outcome of that. Uh, that is clearly relevant to one of the ideas that was mentioned in the Future Grasp white paper about monitoring and predicting effects. Well, when I look at diplomacy, there's a range of things. There's truthful communication, there is posturing, and if you had an AI program get trained on the rhetorical statements of Saddam Hussein or the Kim family in North Korea over the previous decades, it would produce a lot of inaccurate results about what is really true in the international relations space because there is diplomatic rhetoric which is intentionally either hyperbolic or flat out false. So if we know that's endemic to the field of professional diplomacy, that just underscores the concern about trading da training data used for AI algorithms and manipulative inputs. Uh, and especially when you're gonna be talking about sentiment analysis or observing human features and speech intonation and word choice to try to use AI analysis to judge what's actually being said or the true views of the speaker, uh, that's gonna be really, really tough. And as an intelligence analyst, I offer, we're nowhere near yet to be having that be done effectively uh, to capture what would happen in a person-to-person -person diplomatic meeting uh, at large scale between a range of actors and a multi-faceted uh, network. Uh, of course then, hearkening back to the disinformation concept I made earlier, AI permits you to make incredible deep fakes. Uh, those are occurring already, not for nefarious reasons, but President Obama and President Trump have appeared on Chinese TV speaking Mandarin. It didn't look perfect, but that was done for convenience for the Chinese audience to hear the words of the US president. Uh, of course, someone in China got to do the translation and pick the nuanced words that were translated from English to Mandarin, but this is only the beginning. What if diplomatic messages are spoofed or other interpretations and nuances are added? That is a huge problem where diplomacy is a lot about conveying with incredible precision what your national position is. And I think we run the risk finally of over-reliance on the machines themselves and having a greater belief or trust in the potential of AI at this juncture when it really is still in that machine learning computational phase. It has great potential and promise, but I'm not quite sure we're ready to outsource the nuances of diplomacy to these systems and in fact, there's a great international cyber conference called Sci-Fi going on this week uh, based out of Delhi, India, with a very broad international base. A lot of uh, the non-aligned movement and the Southern Hemisphere countries represented. And they had a fantastic panel today specifically about overtrust in machines. And uh, Tom, we can provide a link to that uh, specific discussion. I think it speaks to this a lot. You had folks from Microsoft and other groups talking about specifically this problem. I wanna end with this fourth concept of the outlier effect. I talked about the context within which digital diplomacy is occurring and this social media public international broadcast capacity. I'm gonna offer that one of the biggest effects happening here is gonna be the actual ability to bypass traditional formal diplomacy. One of the questions, uh, preparation questions we had for this panel was about the interdependence between societal, economic, and political threats and how those are being uh, affected by AI algorithms and cybersecurity. Well, if I have the ability to blur those different parameters and factors, to conflate them with disinformation, and to directly communicate with the public citizenry of other countries, maybe I don't need to go through their foreign ministry. Maybe I can attempt to impact the politics and the sentiments of the other population by directly communicating with them. Historically, and certainly before the telegraph and TV and radio, you really couldn't have an ambassador from one country, you know, 5,000 miles away, influencing the public sentiment of all the citizenry of another country. I can do that now. In all these ministries, and not even talking about their intelligence agencies and their carve-outs who are pretending to not be government entities, are on social media. They're actually on the social media platforms in the other country directly. We've seen that with the manipulation of election discourse 
But my biggest concern, and where I'll leave us on the question of applied AI and security, is absolutely the impact it's going to have on the formal diplomatic profession, but maybe even more so the informal ability to actually bypass the authority of those traditional diplomatic roles. I'm going to stop there, and I look forward to our other speaker and the questions that will follow. Thank you. Awesome, Sean. And always insightful. It never, never a surprise coming from yourself with your brilliant, uh, deep expertise therein. So we'll, we'll uh, have, turn to Nikolai and then take several questions. I see a couple questions coming in from the audience as well. Go ahead, Nikolai, if you want to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you, Tom. And uh, so first, uh, this is uh, some really inspirational thoughts across the board. So I'm very, very, very thankful. Great to be here. Uh, thank you to Future, Future Grasp and Business Analytical Institute uh, for having me. Um, maybe I'll actually tag along a little bit to Sean's comments here at the end before I dig into some of the other things that I, uh, I wanted to share. Um, because I think it's a really important aspect. A lot of the things we talk about on this call has been tied to uh, maybe more of the di digital diplomacy versus the AI-driven diplomacy. Uh, they're intertwined, but there is also, I, I think um, right now we're living in a digital world, all of us, uh, remotely connected for good and bad, right? Uh, so it's very apparent right now. Uh, but that also plots the path, in my meaning, to a more AI-driven uh, world of diplomacy in just about every aspect of our society. One of the key things that I think we've seen, uh, you know, tying into what Sean talked about, uh, is that these online networks can be used across the globe, which is built an amazing opportunity for our world, but also it has been abused in many ways. So figure out how we build more secure uh, networks, attribution, understanding of this is a massive issue that needs to be solved for a lot of things, including AI, to work really well on a global scale, including diplomacy, I think. Slightly different topic, right? Uh, as somebody mentioned, yeah, digital trust is, is very, very important. So get, going into the topic here a little bit about, uh, so how, how AI will impact diplomacy you know, I was thinking about this when Tom asked me, and I, I, this is unfortunately why I came up with this. There is no good answer yet, right? Uh, <laughs> but here's kind of what I do now. Artificial intelligence is impacting every single vertical of our society. Um, and that's kind of the thesis that we're working with at Bootstrap Labs. We've been, for the past five years, only investing in applied artificial intelligence and built a large community. So we're the fortune to spend our days immersed uh, with some of the brightest minds in this field. Um, and it is for sure impacting how we communicate, how we transfer values, and, and which is, at, at mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, some of the core aspects of how diplomacy works, right? It also impacts how we, what we bring into those meetings that today happens over Zoom, right? And I mean, there is a lot, lot, lot of things that can be done on, on that end, right? Having the right knowledge about the person on the other side, the right knowledge about uh, the challenges and the world they live in, right? Um, and, and uh, one of the questions uh, going into the panel was about, uh, you, know, you know, powerful compute power, how they, how they have impacted things. And honestly, some of the things we've been doing with AI in the past five years, that we couldn't even imagine five years ago, right, or 10 years ago. So the, the massive advancement of compute power has really moved AI from an intellectual curiosity to, to a real utility. Uh, honestly, most, most of the technologists like myself and researchers and others, they, we all underestimated the massive compute power of, of this computer, right? The number of neurons that are interconnected uh, to be able to build this neural network. Um, and we're not even close, even with the fastest uh, NVIDIA, Mellanox, interconnects and, and GPUs to get even close to this, right? But we're making advancements, right? So this has had tremendous impact and, you know, there's a lot of talk in this call about, uh, or this session uh, about um, replacing humans with AI. You know, and, uh, and my, my view is very, very simple. Look at the past hundred years of how we apply technology uh, as, it, it, you know, it, across our global society. We haven't really replaced humans. We have shifted them to different worlds. We actually overall has given people an ability to be more focused and more specialized and actually achieve a lot more. And AI as a technology 
is not different, but it's a very powerful technology. So it, it is dangerous. There is a lot of things we need to think about this. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, but we have really augmented humans and allowed us to do a lot more. And I think AI is a supercharged version of this. Um, and I think what will happen with this is also like, you know, going back to, to how when it took weeks to go and see, to, to, to do diplomacy across the world, took weeks of travel to the telegraph, will also shift, uh, you know, with a combination of AI, but also you know, the digital, you know, move to digital meetings, uh, the, the in-person meetings will shift to another meeting, which also will bring them probably more value. There are certain things of deeper context that we'll done in in-person meetings as we evolve and figure out how to live with this pandemic and what comes after. Uh, but I don't think the digital meetings will go away. I think they actually will keep scaling and there'll be more of those, right? So going back to AI a little bit, AI is one of those um, things that, you know, there's a lot of buzz about AI uh, and there's very little general knowledge of what you can do with AI. To, to be fair, uh, today, a lot of AI being used is simple classifiers. They're not that sophisticated, or some are sophisticated classifiers, right? Um, but we're starting to see some really interesting things emerge. If I talk to some of the top three experts that are close to us, we had this, I, you know, I had this conversation five years ago or four years ago. Do you think general, you know, artificial general intelligence will emerge? Four years ago, the question, no, no, never. Last year, maybe, right? So, I think from the top researchers, this, the, the sentiment is changing. And, and if we go back to a little bit, to, to some of the things that are being applied and built into things today, we're starting to see something, things like reinforcement learning that are plotting a really interesting path to machines that are actually learning and applying the knowledge themselves. Um, and here is a, here's the big shift, which is the core of everything we do in our investment thesis, is that we're moving to a world where we actually, it's less of the programmers that make the decisions and the logic flow or the state machines of how these computers behave. And it's more of my data as a user of the technology that will impact what it actually does. The AI systems are increasingly being trained from my situations, right? And that's important because there is a lot of, um, you know, and, and, and to be fair to what Chan just said, it's a lot of systems, even with machine learning today, the programmers pick which, which data sets they use. And there's very little transparency that they, of what they use to train the models. And then they ship a compound product and you just use it and you don't know it works, right? But we are shifting increasing to a model where, where we, we are delivering an infrastructure and you need to actually train with your own data. And that decides what happens. So that goes back to, to our, how we work with our own data in organizations and governments and individuals becomes really, really important because that's the foundation for how these systems work. How we make sure that we build security and communications and attribution also is gonna impact all of these systems to, to a much bigger extent than we think, right? If you can tamper, just as we've seen on social media with, with people sentiment, you can tamper with AI sentiment in the future, right? And think about the power behind some of these systems. That can be really dangerous, right? So but this, we talk about a, a light code world or, or you know, light code systems. Um, so this is where we're going with this. Um, I don't think I'm giving you answers, but maybe some things to think about. Um, much of the diplomacy, of course, is not just a physical interaction, right? And I think AI is gonna, in the near term, we're gonna see these systems being able to be applied to actually make you augment what you do in the meeting, but mostly before and after the meeting. It's not the actual meeting uh, in that sense, but be more knowledgeable and understand what happens around the world with the people you're meeting, right? Because I think that if we go back to uh, also, we can build a lot of systems. We see some technologies and emerging startups that have really exciting um, propositions of how to analyze and understand human behavior and video screens, right? So we can build a higher emotional bandwidth as we meet people to, 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 to augment the ability or the fact that we're not meeting them in person. But I am actually very, very cautious about the use in, 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 in the context of diplomacy, because as soon as those are starting to be deployed and good enough, we'll have 
sophisticated AI system to combat them, to actually influence what they do on the other end, right? And this, this is, you know, AI is already weaponized, right? And, and this will just be, you know, an arms race. So I don't think that's where we, we, we long-term can see the biggest utility. I think it's, you know, before and after and around and augment human's ability maybe in the meeting in different ways, right? Um, so um, I have a little bit more, but I think I'll, I'll stop there and maybe go to questions. Excellent, Nicola. Thank you so much for your great insight. So if everybody could go off mute during the panel discussion from the panelist perspective. so. Um, and so Lee and I, uh, during the final panel, we'll hear uh, alternate the questions back and forth as co-moderators. So I'll, I'll ask the first question, specifically since we have such a, an impressive a representative from NVIDIA, Michael Frings here. So Michael, I was wondering, and if you could go off mute too there, um, do you have a sense of how advanced compute coupled with AI might affect this space in the context of our panel discussions today? And I, it's, a, it's a complex question. I mean, I know NVIDIA is, always pushing the envelope. There is constantly new chips coming out, constantly new leadership in the space. Do you have a sense of where this might lead us in this in these contexts today? That's really a very, very difficult question. <laughs> uh, well, as Nikolai said, I, I also strongly believe that uh, AI is uh, uh, not that advanced as uh, people think it is. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the building, uh, it's, it's all about accelerating algorithms at the end of the day. And uh, developing the, that real neural network that at the end of the day will perform similar to a human being, that is uh, still miles to go. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's definitely a challenge. Uh, another challenge is uh, actually very simple, is uh, how... how can we bring as much data as possible to the machine, to the AI, to, to give it something to learn, to work on? Yeah? One of our jobs in NVIDIA is really to supply our customers data. Mm -hmm. uh, they, so they, they say, we want to do a picture, a face recognition. We want to do, uh, let's say, in a Homeland Security context, we need to do video analytics, etc. So then they start asking us, say, so, so give us sample data. We don't have the sample data. We have our data, yeah, criminal uh, investigation, uh, data from criminal investigation, but that's why that is way not enough in order to, uh, to come up with uh, good results. Um, it's not only compute. It's not only uh, the best process in the world, certainly, that is one key thing that is NVIDIA bringing to the, to the market and that in a very special way. Um, but at the end, it's the combination of all. We need data, we need good algorithms, we need this uh, really smart uh, neural networks so that at the end of the day, we will come to a, to a situation where the machine will start writing code on behalf of human beings. And then we will make the next steps into the future. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Lee, you want to go for the next question? You're on mute. Yes, with pleasure. And this time I was not on mute. Uh, I would like to ask or perhaps do a reality check. Even though I haven't run it through an algorithm, I can predict that foreign offices will probably have reduced budgets in the coming years. I would like to ask the technology suppliers given the current limits of AI. I'm specifically thinking about the problems with traceability, the problems with digital trust, the problems of the black box, as well as the fact that diplomats like everyone else don't decide on the data, but on the insights that they derive from the data. Very concretely, where would you counsel foreign offices to invest today in machine learning? With their limited budgets, where can they make an impact? Open question. Uh, I'll throw out a thought or two, if I may, Lee. Uh, I think you would want to invest not in trying to compete with the technology firms to create the technology, 
but in working to ensure its security and its fidelity to the mission to which you are applying it. So I would apply the funds to oversight and security rather than competing with the technologists at the pure innovation level. Uh, and quite frankly, I think with less travel and the ability to reduce stabs by leveraging technology, there will be uh, additional funding available to apply in this area unless you know overall economics shrink the absolute value of the foreign ministries or State Department. But I, I would really focus on ensuring the fidelity of those applications by those ministries rather than trying to innovate, because I certainly I can speak, you know, regarding the U.S. State Department, that is not exactly where I would turn for world-class technology development. They're going to be procuring existing technologies and trying to apply them to their uh, antiquated networks and procedures. Those are just a couple thoughts. I look forward to hearing from the other panelists as well. Thank you, Sean. Other thoughts on this subject? I, I can go. Uh, it I'll take a slightly different turn to it. Right? Somebody else mentioned like a lot of the technologies are coming from the private sector and the big five. And honestly, actually, most of them don't. They come from early stage startups because that's where most of the innovation really happens. And, and a lot of the virtual reality things you're seeing coming, coming from Google, uh, Facebook or whatever, they were startups acquired by Facebook, right? So it comes from the little bubble that I live in. Uh, what I would love to see um, actually my world as a venture capitalist, I, I'm looking for problems. The bigger the problem, the, the more interesting it gets. Like the bigger the opportunity, more the val more value to solve the problem. Um, so what I would encourage, uh, like the State Department, is to actually try to work with Silicon Valley in different ways. And and what Silicon Valley needs is not somebody says, can you can you give me this solution to this? Like, like here's the solution I want. Right? They want. Uh, reach out to people like me and others in Silicon Valley and saying, these are the problems we have, right? Because as, as, as Tom mentioned, uh, or you mentioned, sorry, we, uh, was that, is that, uh, I don't, I, you know, uh, that's probably the best, best suited to, to solve and, you know, innovate uh, around some of these things. But health, Silicon Valley understand the problems um, and build those bridges and build a continuity around that. That would be my advice. Right? Thank you. Michael, did you want to add anything? Yes, I, in my, in, in my experience, a foreign office is always uh, an ent a government entity that goes first in the uh, adoption of, uh, digital, of the digital world. It was in Germany with the, with the uh, worldwide diplomatic network. They were the first with remote office, uh, remote working, the first, the first even long before the pandemic with uh, secure voice over IP and all that stuff. Uh, what we see in the last years is a wider adoption uh, of uh, secure workflow mechanisms. We see that in national contexts. We see that also in the uh, European context, in EU organizations. And I believe, I strongly believe that here it is exactly the point where I, I, AI could step in. Because here is data, here is the content. We are not talking only about email, we are talking about uh, SharePoint, we are talking about shared documents, uh, really big data and secure workflow systems. And that is a point where AI could step in. However, it also has um, brings a, a, a big difficulty with it. And this difficulty is called classification. Data is generally classified into different levels, into different security domains. And that makes it even more complex to apply artificial intelligence. And I believe uh, this is still an open uh, point where uh, technology companies and uh, authorities have to find a way how to use AI in such a classified uh, environment. Yeah. Thank you. Let me pass the mic back to Tom. Thank you very much, Lee, and thanks, everybody. So um, just touching a little bit more upon the security question, this might be uh, specifically for Sean. Uh, in your experience, how are algorithms used today to collect and help analyze data on security threats? And how might that be nefariously or, shall we say, goodly used in the context of where we are today, especially with all the Zooming? Can you expound upon that? Yeah. Uh, you know, they, 
The first question is very, very big. How do you collect and analyze data? Well, that can be from a wide range of different types of platforms and sensors. Uh, you know, your experience in the intelligence community like mine, all different kinds of emanations are collected, all different kinds of information sources. So I don't want to go too broad there. Uh, keeping us to diplomatic communications and things, one place where AI could serve a very valuable security role is in verification and authentication. If you have uh, substantial data on voice recognition for known diplomatic, you know, a series of ambassadors, right? To be able to confirm that that is their real voice, uh, to do very detailed facial recognition or gesticulation or gait recognition, to be able to say, yeah, this really is them. At the same time that you can create deep fakes, you can also be applying AI technologies to uh, try to identify the veracity of things. You can obviously be using AI to include other security mechanisms, whether it's steganography or other kinds of encryption and hashing type things to provide for the authentication of communications and documents. So I would certainly hope that we would be employing all of those techniques on, don't want to leave out blockchain either, uh, all of those techniques to help protect the authentication of diplomatic communications, even when they're not secret, right? But the fact you're going to be transmitting them, they may not be classified, but you still want to be able to authenticate them so that uh, third party meddlers uh, would not be able to interfere with the intended communication. So I think that would be a, a very big area of promise. And maybe that actually is the second half of my answer to Lee's question. I think that would be a very valuable place to invest monies in AI technologies is on those authentication security features. Brilliant. And then follow up a question to Nikolai, specifically being in the venture capital world. Are there, are there specific startup investments or opportunities that you and your, your vast scope of knowledge of where the startup community is going that exist that haven't yet been tapped and might be an opportunity for great uh, venture capital firms like Bootstrap Labs and others, since we do have a very global audience here today? Uh, well, I, I'm Sorry, uh, can you rephrase the, the last part? I, I kind of lost, some okay. went out a little bit. I'm just curious if there's specific startup opportunities you see in this space that might be um, that you could perhaps uh, speak from the context of Bootstrap Labs and its venture capital authorities, specifically because we do have a very global audience today. Well, I'm, I, I would agree with, um, I think some of the most exciting, in the context of digital, digital diplomacy and security, I think immediate, the authentication of communication is a very exciting aspect of this, right? Uh, where I think AI actually needs to be applied to do this well, because the nefarious actors are applying also very sophisticated technology we've seen with these deep fake examples, right? Um, so I think that's an area uh, that's interesting. Um, um, yeah, uh, I think that's... Okay, great. Thanks, Nikolai. I'll pass it off to Lee for perhaps the, the last uh, question and then we'll close out the sessions and the webinar. Brilliant. And since I actually have the floor for the last question after reading what Tom supplied, I think I'll change the question. Sure <laughs> uh, the question was about the future, but I don't think we can talk about the future unless we address the elephant in the room which is the present. AI is based on context, expertise, and experience, and has failed us horribly in predicting the current crisis, and apparently has proved unable to offer us a road into the future. The question that I have for each of you is how can we pivot or tweak AI when we need to recalibrate the experts, requalify the data, and certainly bend the rules to be able to find another road out of the crisis than the one that we took in. Okay. Please. Uh, question. Please do you believe I am a great enthusiast about AI, but I also, since I get asked questions, try to be a realist. 
I, I think we're we're in early days of how we apply AI, and honestly, it's I don't think AI is, has been really applied to try to predict the crisis we're in, um, yeah. uh, and much less to try to solve um, you know find solutions to it. Um, so I think the path is that we need to start to apply both ourselves, right? And I, I think a lot of the failures around the world is in lack of preparedness to manage this current crisis has very little to do with technology and a lot to do with how we govern our countries and, and, and a number of other factors, right? And that's kind of probably where we need to start. But I think we should also start to bring AI into these forums um, and see how we can actually benefit from predicting these things or finding solutions. And uh, it's not been done yet, I think, not to watch enough uh, extent. Thank you, Nikolai. Uh, Sean, Michael? Yeah, if I may, Lee, you raised an interesting question, one that the intelligence community has spent a lot of time on. The uh, concept of expertise and the predictive successes. You know, the entire U.S. intelligence community missed the collapse of the Soviet Union and some other very substantial events. Uh, at the same time, we've seen AI miss things uh, it, it, that we would have wanted it to detect. What I find very interesting, though, is that common wisdom, if you will, is sometime close to the mark. We've all heard discussions of the 100-year pandemic. Well, interestingly, that common parlance was about 18 to 24 months off with predicting COVID after Spanish influenza. So there was a collective knowledge, and maybe this is where concepts of crowdsourcing are to be used to supplement the super forecasters that Philip Tetlock and others talk about, or the experts. And I think those used in tandem, where you have subject matter experts who are then supplemented by AI-driven crowdsourcing of all kinds of disparate and potentially or seemingly unrelated data points that could provide that giant contextual web of information that leads you to say things like, every 100 years there's a global pandemic, or what is it, every 500 million years the caldera Yellowstone erupts, right? That's the next one that we're well over on besides being two years over on a uh, pandemic before COVID. So, uh, I think there's a huge role for AI to supplement. And in fact, this is largely where the IC is going with some of its work, maintaining expertise, creating a prediction market where you have a bunch of skilled individuals who are making predictions, even if it's not their specific portfolio question. And then you also have massive crowdsourcing of the general populace or other folks. And when we say crowdsourcing, we're not just talking about taking opinion polls from people. I'm talking about using AI to analyze cell phone data or sound bites posted on social media from all over the world that just might be a part of that collective information network that could provide you inductive insights to complement the deductive procedures of an intelligence apparatus. Yeah, what I refer to as collaborative intelligence, co-developing human and machine intelligence. Michael, would you like to have the last word before we pass the mic back to Tom? Well, that's an honor <laughs> to have the last word. Uh, well, you know, talking about COVID uh, is a very good example that sometimes you just don't need an AI. You just need to, know, you need to have common sense, right? And when in the early days, when we realized that there was a virus getting out of a lab in China or uh, somehow else uh, trans was transferred to uh, to an animal, from an animal to a human being. It was not rocket science to predict that that virus would end somewhere on the other side of the world, right? Because we are living in globalization with all the goods and the bads. So I don't think we can blame any AI for not predicting that because as uh, Sean said, there was no AI looking after that, right? So uh, AI, also, the question is how can AI make our life better in the future and how, how can we make sure that that will not happen again? At the end, there is no one such AI, no one AI. There are millions of, millions of AI algorithms and all these algorithms have somehow, what they need is kind of a standardization, right? A standard that could be applied to something 
according to a certain rule of uh, engagement, rule of uh, morale, rule of social behavior. And then we might have the possibility to, well, predict something uh, because it, again, then we have an AI common, common sense. Uh, but that's that's something what we we don't have, and we I, I don't see that we will have that in the foreseeable future because we are still in the gold digger uh, time of AI. So there are no rules. Everybody is doing what he thinks is suitable and uh, will um, bring us uh, further and have a better benefit or whatever. So, but that, this is something really that uh, that has to be taken under consideration. Nvidia, for instance, for instance, has a program that's called AI Nation, where we uh, look particularly after this, uh, after uh, the fact how nations are going to apply AI, and maybe it's like with the with the with the cell phone. At the end of the day, we need a standard for communication between not only between human beings but also between AIs, and how they how they analyze data or they predict data. And um, yeah, I think standard, a standard, somehow a standard will bring us uh, further. Thank you, all three of you, for the quality of these insights. Tom, would you like to wrap it up? Well, first off, I'd like to thank uh, Lee and myself jointly uh, thanking everybody, the panelists in this panel, the panelists in the past two panels. I think this was a very rich and useful discussion. Um, love to continue the dialogue with everybody here in the in the future. Um, these problems will not go away. I think we're in in the uh, unfortunately in the long haul of the pandemic. There's there's still case counts going up in the United States dramatically and in Europe and in Asia right now. So um, we have to deal with these issues. And I think the great insights that we received today can go a ways toward that. So I'll close off here just by sharing one last slide real quick. So here is our contact information. Anybody, oops, sorry. Um, we'd like to reach out to Lee and myself up there. So just to repeat uh, the um, opening statement that Lee clarified earlier, it is our goal and was our goal for running this webinar to engage the leaders in governments, intergovernmental organizations and business to better appreciate the implications and opportunities within this space of digital diplomacy, however we so define it. Together, Future Grasp and VAI offer training, consulting, and tech support services to enhance foresight, trust, and communication, and decision-making by leveraging human and machine intelligence. So we really look forward to engaging with everybody in the panels, as well as the audience members. We did have a great showing from the attendees around the world, and I'd like to sign off. And again, thank everybody for their brilliant um, insights today and i hope everybody has a great rest of the evening day wherever you happen to be around the world love to follow up with you in the future again the web webinar recording will be posted on linkedin and twitter and shared so i'll, I'll make an attempt to send it to all the panelists directly if the file isn't too big uh, and we'll see if we can get that out and uh, feel free and use it to your uh, ability we're getting a lot of thanks from folks around the world on chat and so again have a wonderful great day and uh, thanks for your participation Keep safe. Take care. Thank you. Bye.